So in the cultural segment today, I want to pull a lot of this stuff I've been talking about, not just today, but the last couple of weeks together. And I want to start with this very disturbing video uh, from the Allendale United Methodist Church in St. Petersburg, Florida. The senior pastor, Andy Oliver, uh, welcomed a drag queen, Isaac Simmons, who dresses up as a woman and calls himself Ms. Pentecost, I guess, so you understand his connection to the demonic <laughs> Pennywise and Stephen King's It. Uh, here is a portion of this video where this pastor, Andy Oliver, uh, introduces Miss Pentecost to these children. Do you have any questions for Miss Pentecost? I like her eyeshadow. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you like her eyeshadow. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Maybe she'll let you borrow it when you're older, like when you're allowed to wear makeup. Just, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, one of the things I think is great about Miss Pentecost is she reminds us that we, we follow a God who calls us to not conform to things of this world, uh, that we're supposed to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. And that means that what I think today may have to change tomorrow if I continue to renew my mind. And it's so cool that we serve a God that calls us to continue to grow and continue to, to change into something new. Huh. Interesting. We follow a God. It's that God with the horns and the spiked tail, but never mind. Never mind that part. But let me tell you, it's a lot of these things uh, bother me. A lot of things bother me about this, obviously. It's a horrific video, I think. Uh, but but let's get, it's it's not the fact that these introducing to these drag queens. I mean, Jesus did say if anyone causes uh, any of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. So that's going to be disturbing, but that's their problem. Uh, but Pentecost, this uh, transvestite, is the first openly gay candidate to be certified for ministry in the Illinois Great Rivers Conference, which is a regional body of 800 churches in the southern two-thirds of the state of Illinois. He's up for being a pastor, right? He's the first openly gay candidate to be certified for ministry. Here's a poem he wrote, Isaac Simmons wrote, uh, a.k.a. Pentecost, Miss Pentecost. Here's a, a poem that he wrote about the Bible, a little bit of it This cut 16. Look, the Bible... Bible is nothing, nothing but poetry, pain, and performance. The Bible is no more holy than Allen Ginsberg's Howls of Life, no more peaceful than Oscar Wilde's Requiescat and Pache, and no more stronger than Tammy Faye's damn eyelash glue. God himself is no more tangible than the concophony of invisible butterflies floating in new lovers' stomachs yearning to be set free from the bondage of past harm and the lacks of rightful mistrust. God himself is nothing. <laughs> so the Methodists want a pastor of God who is going to teach that God is nothing. But more important than that God is nothing as that God is no more real than the flutterings of uh, butterflies fluttering in the hearts of, of young lovers. In other words, your desire is everything. It's everything. There is no, uh, uh, there's nothing else. That's it. It's your desire. This is what I'm ta talking about is he's going to be a pastor of the lie, right? Uh, this is called, by the way, you know, a lot of this gender stuff grows out of what was called a French, a French philosophy, post-structuralism, uh, deconstructionism, where they deconstructed things. But uh, it, it's really idolatry. Yeah, this is off topic a little bit, but just very quickly, uh, you know, people see things and experience things over the long history of time, and they invent words to communicate them to one another and to express them to one, and to express their feelings about them to one another. And so words have a history and they develop over time. And yes, they come along with some prejudice which maybe we clean out of them, and their words evolve and they change their meanings, but they create a structure of understanding that we is the human understanding through the centuries. Uh, and what the deconstructionists do is they deconstruct that structure of words and think that they have deconstructed reality. Remember, the words are just a way of describing reality, and they have their flaws, and they have to change over time. But what the, what the deconstructionists think, it's idolatry. They mistake the symbol, which is the word, the symbol of reality, for the reality. And they think by deconstructing the words, by making what is a woman mean nothing, uh, they have now dis deconstructed the lives, the actual lives and experiences of being a woman because they really don't believe that that inner experience is connected to anything real, that your subjective experience is actually a reflection of a spiritual experience. They don't believe that. It's just a thing that was created and can be torn apart. But that's because there are idolaters who believe in the word rather than in uh, the spirit. Now, 
I, I want to link this to Candace's new film, The Greatest Lie Ever Sold, which she had a premiere and Kanye West was there. I couldn't go because I'm flying around. I'm leaving the studio and flying off to Italy for a, a conference there. And then I have to fly around some more. So I just thought this one more flight. But I watched it at home and pretend that Con I pretended Kanye was with me. Uh, and, and Candace uh, tracks down um, what happened to all the tens of millions of dollars that were given to Black Lives Matter uh, off the death of violent drug addict George Floyd in police custody. And this is just a little bit of, of what Candace found. Let's cut one. Black Lives Matter designated a whopping $8 million to an out-of-country grant. What? I thought this charity was about addressing police brutality in the United States. Apparently to do that, you need to send $8 million to Toronto, Canada, to an organization named M4BJ. And I should also mention that M4BJ is run by Patrice's wife, Janaya Khan, because it is. She is the co-founder, believe it or not. And here's where it gets really interesting. Janaya Khan is gender non-conforming. Now that information would be entirely irrelevant if it wasn't for the way that Patrice Cullors saw it fit to spend the rest of Black Lives Matter's money. Ready for some BLM pride? Well, according to their IRS form, $200,000 went to the Transgender Justice Funding Project. Another $200,000 went to the Transgender United Fund. Another $200,000 went to the Transgender Law Center. <laughs> So you, now, so you see that this Black Lives Matter, which is supposed to theoretically help black people in America when all their tragic uh, experience, which some of it actually is tragic, instead it's, it's paying for this transgender stuff, which is, reflects the lives of the uh, Maoist, uh, the ma trained Marxists, as they call themselves, who run Black Lives Matter, who are lesbians, one of whom is uh, transgender. So how, why does all this come together like this? Because all lies are one lies. What is going on? You know, why and how do we begin to respond to this big lie? So two weeks ago, we were discussing how this is a difficult political period of transition because all these epochs are ending at once. Post-World War II period, the Reagan era, the baby boom generation, and the and a new era, the internet era, is, is beginning to be born. And so there's all these moments of uh, when, like almost like a, um, a middle age uh, crisis. Can I throw out this part of my life, do something totally new? Can we do something totally new and change everything? It's given rise to a struggle, a couple of struggles. One is the struggle between the concept of the nation state, where the individual and the family and the state and then the fed federal state and then the world uh, under a, a God, under the guidance of God, uh, basically care for the freedom of peoples and families, of individuals and families. That's on one side. And then you have the other side, which is the concept of global governance run by what our guest Emily Finley called democratism, in which the language of democracy is used to describe rule by unelected experts and elites who decide in their wisdom what the popular will would be if the people weren't deplorable, okay? So that's essentially what happens is Steven Pinker, he says, and he supports this, that people don't need to be free, they just need to feel that they're free. They need to feel that they have a choice of what's going on. Now at the same time, right, there's also this battle uh, on the home front between our basic standards and values, uh, which are are always going to fall apart and become uncertain in these moments of great change, right? Uh, so that leaves room for activists who say they represent those who feel excluded from those values, unfairly excluded from those values. And at first they say, please include us in this wonderful society your values built. And then they say, now we're in the house. We're going to redo the whole house. We're going to destroy all those values. And we're going to say, no, those values were wrong because they excluded us and were hurt. Reality has done them wrong, right? I mean, they feel to some degree Agree that they're excluded from even uh, the simple thing of the normal life of man and woman creating children and families. And so they're going to change that. They're going to say that's not a value. And since there are no real values, there's only the values inside yourself, we can do that. Now, if you think about it, you can see where the interests of the globalist elite and the interests of the activists have a place in common, in the Venn diagram in common. And as we know, Kamala Harris loves Venn diagrams, so she'll love this. The globalists can support the activists in dismantling the power centers of nationalism, which are local culture, religion, and family, which means the globalists can then take power and replace that power, that individual family and church and locality power, with global power, the power of the experts and the elite, right? And they can do it while wrapped in a rainbow flag because the rainbow people are destroying those 
uh, bastions of local power. So you see their interests coincide. And this is why corporations support the activists, why corporations wave the rainbow flag, because globalism opens markets everywhere, and it keeps those pesky localists from saying, you know, there is some values that are more important than pure profit making, right? You know, mom says it's not all about money, not everything is money, and the Global corporations are saying, no, wait, no, every, no everything is money. Don't say that, mom. So, you, mom, you got to get out of the way. So we're not teaching your children that. This is why Georgia Maloney was saying they want you to be perfect consumers and they're going to take away, uh, this is the new upcoming prime minister of Italy, they're going to take away your family, your identity, uh, your gender identity, your national identity, your religious identity, or just replace it with consumerism. And they, she's right about that. But it's all of these, uh, of all of these interests are coinciding in this moment, right? Which is which is why you're going to find that mom is the center of the fight back. But they're all coinciding. And what the globalists say to the activists is, yes, you know, you, we're going to give you equality. We're going to give you equality. But what they don't tell them it's that, is that it's an equality of misery. As a trans person, now you can cut your testicles off and then stand in line with all the other miserable people waiting to get a gallon of gas for your moped because you're not allowed to own a car, right? So that's going to be great for you. But you're, you've already helped them destroy the bastions of power that would have kept them from destroying the world that you live in. So it's a power struggle wrapped in a battle of ideas disguised as a struggle for individual identity. And on the other side, you know, on the one side of the people who love the individual, believe in the family, and the other side of the people who love mankind, but they hate the people because the people are deplorable. And they keep telling you, by the way, we just, we just want full power just for a, a little while, just for a little while, and then there will be no power structures anymore. The state takes all the power, but then, <laughs> hooray, miraculously, there won't be any power structures anymore. It just takes 10, 20,000 years, and then we'll let go of our power, and you can have it all back, and you'll be free. Now, obviously, those of us who believe in God, family, and country have been slow to organize, right? Because we depended on the big institutions to help us, and now those institutions have been corrupted uh, by, we can identify them as the left, but it's really more than that. It's this globalist uh, co coalition of globalists and activists destroying local power. We want to fight back by being who we are, right? We don't, it's not about the blacks or the gays or, the, or even the transgender people. It's not about any of that. It's about the activists and the globalists acting together. So if we sit around and hate the, the Jews or the blacks or anybody else, we don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. We simply need to construct new institutions from the ground up. And that's a hard task, but it's not an impossible task. They took the institutions away. We can build them back. We built them the first time. We can build them back. And I think I've said this before. It starts with the family. But I think you also have to have the church, right? And the churches, when the churches are bringing these guys who don't believe in God and to become pastors, we can say the church is not the church. The church is done. The church is gone. Uh, it, it's, it's gone. It's not, you know, there's no point and purpose in complaining about it. It's like Hollywood. You're not going to convince them. You have to start it again. And I want to talk a little bit about what that means, what, why we should turn back to churches. Remember, Jesus said, if even two or more of, of you are gathered in my mind, uh, uh, in, in my name, I will be there. So we can start churches with very little. We can start it with families. We can start, you know, two families in a Bible are going to start a church for you. And that's all it's really going to take. Or you can find a church that is still a splinter, like I did. I found a, a splinter of a splinter uh, church where they're still preaching the gospel. And so, you know, what, what is the point? What is the purpose? What do we believe that they don't believe? They believe that this identity is just the butterflies fluttering in your, you know, your uh, chest. Uh, we believe that there's a connection between us and the spiritual, supernatural level of life. And Jesus said, I'm the true vine. If you want to bear fruit, and he says, I'm the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit. He says, remain in me as I remain in you because no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. And you can picture that image in your head. If you cut a branch off a tree, it's no longer going to bear fruit if you put it on the tree. The tree is that spiritual being, that spiritual presence of Christ that links us to the supernatural meaning of the world. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to become that person you know you're supposed to be, but can't be. And is that person the butterflies fluttering in your, you know, in your desirous uh, heart? No, it's not. It is, in fact, an emptying out of that person, an emptying out of those, you know, cacophonous calls for ego and money and, and desire, and letting the spirit flow into you. That's the point of being attached to the vine, is the vine, the blood of the vine blow, flows into you, and you become, you know, it's like St. Paul said, 
It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that's what you're trying to get to. Now, why do I believe so much in ritual? Why do I believe that ritual is, is the important thing? Here, here's why. Because all of us, all of our lives are, are passages to God. The left and all these people are telling you that it's just your desire. It's who you want to sleep with. It's what you want to do. It's even the right does this. They say, oh, you know, you, you can, the pursuit of happiness is building a business, making a fortune. You came here with nothing. The immigrants came here with nothing, but now they're rich. I'm telling you, all of that stuff is good or bad as it may happen. But, but the your point of your life is becoming that person you know you're supposed to be by emptying out all the accidents of your life and letting f- something flow into you that is the spirit. Now, why why does ritual help you do that? Why you know this is where I think the Catholics are better uh, than the Protestants is they still believe in the ritual. And I believe very much in the bread and wine. Knowles believe I've I've never prayed the rosary, but Knowles swears by it and I'm not not opposed to it. I, I will definitely try it, but I think that these rituals are incredibly important. Why? Because Things that happen to your life get between you and God, right? Your mom and dad are supposed to represent God to you. They're supposed to be a passage for you from matter into the spirit. They're supposed to be the male and female image of God. But we know our parents, uh, you know, they they fail us a lot of times. They abuse us. Our father abuses us. Our mother leaves. You know, they, they get divorced. Things fall apart. And now, in your heart, that thing that you were saying, oh, because you're just a kid, right? You think, oh, this is my passage to that thing that I am supposed to be. And now it's fallen apart. It blocks your uh, it blocks your path to God. So now when you pray to God, you see the abusive father. Now when you pray to God, you see the abandoning mother. What, what symbols do, what ritual does, is it depersonalizes that passage. It says, I know, I know, Life went wrong. Life went wrong. Your father was abusive, but God's not abusive. Your mother abandoned you, but God will not abandon you. Come to the bread and wine. It has nothing. It has nothing. It's just bread and wine. It has bread and wine, but we will transform it through ritual, through prayer, through understanding, through concentration. We will transform that into the body and blood, and soon you will begin to construct a world in which all of these material things will lead you back to God. And that's, that is the living life, the living life, the true life, the, the end of the covenant with death is understanding that it's not you. It is you are just the branch on a vine. And that vine, when you let that vine flow into you, you will find. And and by the way, it's instantaneous. It's not, I mean, it's, it's, it happens slowly. It happens inch by inch. It happens every day. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to say, oh yes, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You don't have to do any of that stuff. You just have to show up, do the rituals, say the prayers, read the book. That's all you have to do. And day by day, you will find that you change. It will change you. You will start to shed the personal things that have uh, derailed you and have derailed that passage. They are going to be preaching this. They're going to be preaching it from the centers of power. You are going to be preaching it from that weak, crushable thing that is your individual family, your individual church, your individual town, and you are going to win. And that's how it's going to work. It is. It's true. I know. It is absolutely impossible. It is David versus Goliath. Just remember what happened to him. You are going to win. But it's got to start with you. It's got to be in your life. It has got to be in your life. Don't sit around screaming at the TV. Don't sit around pointing your finger at the TV. Begin with your life, your spouse, your family, your church, your town. You will conquer the world. Wow, that was unbelievably great, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And you want more, so like and subscribe, and also subscribe to the Andrew Clavin Podcast.